Rataliaka Games. Rataliaka and Man Eater Games. Oh, good God. <laughs> it's Blind Men, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know anything about it. I think it's a blind date sim game kind of deal again. Certainly getting that vibe from the music. It's available on the Nintendo Switch, but we're doing it today here on the PS4 du jour. Because I'm Seth Trav, and in keeping with that tradition, like I said, we don't know much about this one. So, with that, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start up Blind Man. When I was seven, I was sent to live with my uncle. I had just lost my parents to a car accident, the same one that left the right side of my face disfigured. Let's set it to auto. He did his best to make me feel welcome, but it wasn't enough. Bullied by my peers and ignored by people that were supposed to help me, I didn't fit in anywhere, and I spent most of my childhood thinking that I was it was somehow all my fault. One day after I came home crying, my uncle pulled me aside and said to me, People are fools, Keegan. Blinded by their own stupidity, they seek to destroy what they don't understand. But people like you and me, we're different. We're better. Never forget that. At that moment, it all became clear. I finally understood what I had to do. I'd follow my uncle's footsteps, and I'd show them. So, what do you think? I'm only missing the essay section of the application. I don't know why the League even asks for one. There is nothing particularly evil about good grammar. I laughed nervously at my own bad attempt of making a joke. The League of Evil is the highest authority when it comes to criminal activity around the world. They can make or destroy a supervillain's career with a single word, and even those that don't answer to them know better than to oppose them. Membership is for life, and vacancies are rare and far and in between. Even getting the opportunity to apply is difficult enough. I am perfectly confident in my ability to deliver a flawless application, of course, but one can never be too sure. Which is exactly how I ended up asking one of my uncle's henchmen for his opinion on my application. It's about passion. Common criminals are a die. There's <laughs> a henchman, so. Uh, common criminals are a die but dozen, but being a supervillain requires true dedication. He claps his hands together in excitement. He's almost as enthusiastic as I am about the idea of me getting to join the League, which makes the fact that I have no idea of what his name is rather embarrassing. It's not that I don't care, it's just that after a while, henchmen just sort of blend in together. During training, we were shown the video of the boss's speech at the Allied Nations. It was wonderful. Half the room was in tears by the end of it. It's the one about how powerful countries abuse the vote system of the organizations to legitimize their actions, isn't it? I've seen it too. It's really good. Uh, it's not for nothing that human resources make... <laughs> it's not for nothing that human resources make all the new recruits watch it. In just a few words, you can really feel what the boss is about. What makes them different from all the other supervillains out there? You don't need to worry so much. Right from the heart, I'm sure you'll do fine. Besides, your sphinx is a nephew. It runs in the family. He said so himself, didn't he? I groan. Uh, don't even start. It's bad enough that people think I only got the opportunity because of him in the first place. The last thing I want is for it to actually be true. Getting into the League by my own merits is the only way I'll ever be taken seriously as a villain. By them and by everyone else. Not to mention, he has this weird idea about how spending all my time down here is not good for me. And it's not something recent either, because intelligence agencies were always looking for my uncle. We never stayed too long in one place. As a result, I was homeschooled for most of my life. But ever since I finished my high school studies three years ago, he's been trying to get me to enroll in college, an actual college with other normal people. At first, it was just subtle hints that and the occasional comment which I accepted is his way of showing he cared about my future. However, since last month, he's been bringing a bunch of pamphlets home. He went as far as outright telling me that if I was having problem, having, 
if I was having problem choosing, I should study engineering like he did. Speaking of the boss, what are you planning to tell him? I have managed to keep the application process a secret for the better part of a year, but it can't remain that way forever. As proud as it makes me that he hasn't found out yet, I'm no fool. I know that luck has played at least some part in it. Besides, I meant it when I told the henchman that my uncle is the biggest is my biggest inspiration. His approval would mean a lot to me. The next time you see him, I suppose, it will be better if he hears it from me now and not from the league after I get accepted. He hates being left out, and considering what I'm planning, he might just have a stroke. Well, there's your chance. He's headed our way. What? He was supposed to come back until... He was not supposed to come back until tonight. The henchman shrugs. I turn around and see my uncle walking through the door. He has never been a particularly expressive man, but he looks even more serious than usual. Good morning, boss! The henchman salutes him, and my uncle dispenses him with a nod. As he leaves, he silently mouths, Good luck! in my direction. Traitor! You're early. There was an explosion in the lab. There's toxic material everywhere, and since it will take the cleanup crew a few hours to get rid of it, I told everyone to go home for the day. I look down and notice that his clothes are stained with some kind of black substance. Instinctively, I take a step back. He looks down as well, shakes his head, and waves his hand in a dismissive gesture. This is just oil. I was working on some of my old prototypes when I was informed of the explosion. Anything I can help with, boss? No. I want to clear up some space in the storage room. I'll get rid of whatever I can. I can't get working. Uh, and how many times do I have to tell you that you don't need to call me that? Sorry, I spent so much of my time with the henchman. Rubs off after a while. Among other things. Uncle, really? That was years ago, and it only happened once. As far as I know, only because he got eaten by a shark before it could happen again. Hmm, yes. The time the feeding cage malfunctioned and our perfectly trained sharks decided to have him for lunch instead. What an unfortunate coincidence. The corner of his lips quirk, quirks up in an amused smile. I barely resist the urge to roll my eyes. Have you had time to go through the pamphlets? Gentrich exams begin next month. You, so you have to submit your papers as soon as possible. I spoke with Madame Mantis. She said that if you're interested in moving to America, she'd be happy to help you with anything you need. Ever since she retired, she has amassed quite a bit of contacts on the Board of Education. In fact, if you were getting everything else ready before next Friday, she'll probably write you a recommendation letter. I've met her a couple times. She was a proper villain, the kind of woman that never does things out of the kindness of her heart, meaning that either asked her, meaning that he either asked her for a favor or she owed him one. Either way, I bet he's only telling me this, so I feel pressured into enrolling. I'm glad that you brought this up, because I've been meaning to talk with you about that. You have? Does that mean you've chosen a college already then? Not exactly. Not exactly. Hegan, cut to the chase. What if I didn't want to go to college? He stares at me in silence for what feels like an eternity. Finally, he closes his eyes and begins to rub his temples. We've been over this before. You need to do something with your life. You do a good job around here, but you can't keep running around with the henchman forever. Wait, just hear me out. The reason I don't want to go to college is because... I want to become a supervillain, just like you. In fact, I've already contacted the League. They think I've got a lot of potential, Uncle. They are just waiting for me to submit my full application. When did you even have time to do that? I... Save it. That's not important. Helping me out and being an actual supervillain are two completely different things. The League's application process is infamously hard for a reason, Keegan. Many people have died trying to impress the Council. Why do you even want to be one? Uncle, please. I've got I've gone through the curriculum of every major college in the world. Several times actually. They've got nothing to teach me. I could go straight to the doc to a doctorate for about every field I'm interested in. Why should I waste my time with frivolities when I could be doing something that actually matters? You are the one that 
always says that people just don't know what's best for themselves. Well, I do. Besides, I've been helping you out practically my whole life. I'm not making an uninformed decision. I know exactly what I'm getting myself into. Are you sure about this? I've never been more sure about anything. Have you decided how you are going to co- how you are going to call yourself? Do you have a base of operations? What about a plan? How are you going to pay for everything? Do you remember the weapons dealer that sold you the parts you were missing for the death ray? Turns out that he also handles mercenary contracts, and he comes highly recommended in that regard. He said that he would lend me some of his bases and some people if I went over a couple of the blueprints his scientists are working on. I know it's not ideal, but it would only be for a day or two. After I'm accepted in the league, I'll have enough resources to get my own. He crosses his arms, and there's another moment of silence. If you're serious about this, I won't be the one to stop you. But you are going to do this properly. Call the weapons dealer and tell him that you won't be needing his services anymore. You'll use my lair and my men. We'll draft a contract, and if anybody asks, you rented them. Thank you, Uncle. I promise I won't disappoint you. Of course you won't. Now come, tell me more about your plan. A month later. Location. National Museum of Science. Bah. Germany. I pretend to adjust the strand of my hair behind my ear, pressing the button in my earpiece to increase the volume. Was, I'm in the control room. I'm taking care of the security recordings. The police won't find anything of use in any of them. The men are all in their posts and ready to go, too. I'll be waiting for your signal. I'll stay here a little while longer to keep an eye on things. Please let me know if you understood. I nod. All right. See you in the auditorium, boss. As an aspiring supervillain, particularly one hoping to join the League, there are two things to be taken into account when it comes to carrying out plans. Visibility and chance of success. Just like there's no point in doing something so uninspired that it barely makes it to the local news, there's no point in getting arrested on national television. Finding balance is key, and that's exactly why I've chosen Bonn's National Museum of Science as my target. It's a beautiful place, and just like research, just like its research center, hosts many important scientists. Its vault is home to a lot of rare and expensive equipment. Despite that, under normal circumstances, there wouldn't be anything particularly worth stealing here. But starting today, the museum will be hosting the Schultz Holt mu collection of rare minerals. Its main piece being the famous Anglo Diamond. Besides being one of the largest cut precious stones known to man, its purity and chemical composition make it one of the most versatile energy conductors in the world. In addition to the exhibit itself, the museum board has also invited Professor Saltz to give a conference at the end of the inaugurational par inauguration party. Schultz is both a geologist and a political activist, and he's greatly respected in both fields. To make sure that no other villain interferes, I told both the League and my uncle that I'd be planting bombs in the museum and holding the guest hostage for a ransom. Very few people are willing to risk getting blown up by a first-timer, after all. But actually, my real plan is... I'm going to kidnap the professor. As a public figure involved in politics, Schultz's appearance will be all the news will be will talk about for as long as he's missing kidnappings are hardly my area of expertise but all things considered they are pretty straightforward and it's not like we'll have to deal with him for long afterwards in any case i'm certain that both the americans and the russians will be willing to pay a hefty sum to get their hands on him if i had to guess i'd say that they'll want to claim they were the ones who saved him making the other side look incompetent or maybe We'll just use the opportunity to get rid of him while the blame falls on someone else. It's a great plan if I say so myself. If my nerves don't kill me first, that is. Until Schultz's conference begins, there isn't much to do for me except wait. The only reason I got here at the beginning of the inauguration in the first place was in case the henchmen needed me for something. Unfortunately, that also means I've had plenty of time to go over the plan in my head, including all the little details that could go wrong. I hate to admit it, but my uncle was right. Being the mastermind of a plan instead of just another person helping out is a completely different experience. But it doesn't matter. When I join the League, I'll get to tell the story whichever way I want. None of the boring parts, none of the doubt. Everything was perfect on the first try. In the end, I decide to go grab a drink at the bar while I wait. 
The bar is actually more of a counter in one of the corners of the lobby than its own separate place. It's meant for people who want to get something to drink without having to find a place at one of the tables or wait for servers to take their order. As I approach, the first thing I see is a man surrounded by a small group of people, most of them women. I can't get a good look at him from over here, but every once in a while, the whole group erupts in laughter. <laughs> After the third or so time that it happens, the bartender walks over from behind the counter and says something to them. He probably asked them to either lower their volume or leave since the group began. Group, since the group began to disperse right afterwards. Now, by himself, the man takes a seat next to another blonde man. He leans back on the chair and begins swinging it back and forth. Hello, Gov. Oh, he looks rough. No wonder I was surrounded by women. He's pretty handsome, and the man next to him isn't too bad himself, either. Definitely a much better view than what I had at the lobby. A moment passes, and the man in the tuxedo says something. They exchange a few words, but the expression on the blonde man's face is so unfriendly that they don't really go beyond that. If looks could kill. In any case, I don't much have time to think about it. At the exact moment, the first man turns around and our eyes meet. I look away to see if he'll do the same, but he doesn't. Instead, I can feel him staring at me until I give up and look back. He makes a gesture at the bartender to order another of whatever he's having. Now, with the additional glass in his hand, he approaches, stopping right next to me and leaning against the counter. Hunter? Having fun? From his body language and his accent, I'd say he's American. I wave my hand in a dismissing manner. Not really. Watching the governor try to explain the merits of mineralogy has been the highlight of my evening so far. These things are usually more lively. Well, as lively as Vince Lee's sort can get. Last time there was this professor from Columbia? What was his name? Anyway, he's convinced that Schultz mythology is faulty. So he always ends up causing a ruckus whenever they meet. But this time, this committee made sure that the guest list is inoffensive as possible. You didn't hear that from me, of course. Of course. Drink? He raises the glass towards me. I saw him order it, but it... I didn't see the bartender pour it, so of course I'm not going to accept it. I shake my head and pick up my own glass. Almost empty by now, from the counter. No thank you. I already had one. He shrugs and takes a sip. It's quite good, isn't it? German alcohol is one of the two reasons I'm glad that the Soviets only got to keep half the country. And the other one is... Germans! By now it's become clear he's flirting with me. Whether he's actually doing a good job is a different point altogether. I decide to... Uh, flirt back at every opportunity you flirt. Well, two can play the same game. Let's see him put his money where his mouth is. Of course, one of those things is much more fun than the other. He laughs, put down one of the glasses, and offers me his free hand. I take it and give him a grin in return. The handshake lasts a couple more of more seconds, a couple of seconds more than strictly necessary, and instead of simply letting go at the end, he slides his fingers across my palm. I curl my fingers slightly so that they interlock briefly at the end. That does it. He begins oogling me in what's possible the least subtle manner known to man. Johns, it's a pleasure to meet you. The pleasure's all mine. Don't take this the wrong way, but you look kind of young for an academic. I'm still an undergrad. I'm hoping for a chance to discuss my thesis with Schultz before I submit it. Asking Schultz for his opinion about an undergrad thesis? That's quite a high bar you set for yourself. Trust me, you don't even know the half of it. So, what's this all about? In simple terms, I'm researching ways to improve the accuracy of the tools used to locate and harvest petroleum deposits. It would make extraction quicker, cheaper, and more environmentally friendly. Right now, it's all theory, but I'm pretty sure that my calculations will lead, it, lead to it being applicable. That's quite impressive. All the better for me. I like him smart. With a grin, he puts his hand on my shoulder and leans closer to me until his face is practically touching mine. His breath feels hot against my ear, 
and mixed with the faint smell of alcohol coming from him, it's enough to send a shiver down my spine. Maybe we could discuss some of your ideas in private. I'm tempted. So very tempted. But if I miss Schultz, my thesis supervisor will have my head. I take a step back and he lets go of my arm. What a shame. I understand. Next time then? He picks up the glass, chugs down the rest of the drink, and winks at me before turning around and walking away. As soon as he's out of my sight, I let out a sigh. What gall. If I had been anyone else, this could have ended ugly for him. Well, it doesn't matter. I'm not planning to see him again anytime soon. There's a buzzing sound from one of the nearby speakers, and I turn my attention to it. First call, please proceed to take your seats. The conference will begin in 15 minutes. When the announcement is done, I head towards the auditorium. Other than the first two rows, which have been reserved for politicians and the press, the seats aren't numbered. Terribly inconvenient for people that would rather secure a good place without having to enter early or wait too long in line for it. On the other hand, it's perfect for someone like me that would rather not have a name attached to their ticket. When one of the ushers takes my ticket, I recognize him as one of my uncle's men, just like the henchman said. He directs me towards a free seat at the corner of one of the middle rows. Perfect. Nothing would ruin a dramatic entrance like having to ask people to stand up so I can get to the stage. Once I'm at the seat, it quickly becomes obvious that obvious why one had why no one had taken it yet. Sitting next to me is the blonde man from the hall reading the program with an expression on his face just as unfriendly as the one he had back there. Excuse me. Is this seat taken? He looks at me, shakes his head, and goes back to reading without a single word. Under any other circumstance, I wouldn't care, but come on. He talked to the other man at the bar, and I didn't get more than a side glance. It's entirely possible for him to just be some regular guy with bad social skills and poor German, but he didn't even attempt to answer in English either. I decided to give my gut feeling a try, and... Leaning closer to him and lowering my voice so that no one else will hear, I begin to speak to him in Russian. I've heard that Russians have a lot of trouble getting travel permits nowadays, even those who have never been to the Soviet Union. I can't even imagine how hard it must be for actual Soviets to get out of out their country. That gets his attention, enough to put down the program and turn to my to face me. He looks like he's assessing me and trying to intimidate me at the same time. So I'm completely honest with myself. Why am I interested in talking with him? Uh... There is something suspicious about him, but I want to be vain. It's a matter of pride, really. Being related to a supervillain and soon to be one myself, I may need to keep a low profile, but I won't stand for being so blatantly disregarded. Having an interest in geoscience is not a crime either. His German accent, his German doesn't have any less of an accent, but because he doesn't have to whisper, it's actually easier to understand. Of course not, but you do know that he'll be giving the conference in German, don't you? And frankly, the translators the museum usually hires are terrible. It's not even close to being the same experience. I am speaking with you, aren't I? My German is good enough. This is quite different from a scientific presentation. What do you really want? I'm just trying to have a conversation with the person sitting next to me. Why? Should it be about something else? No, of course not. We exchange a look of suspicion before he goes back to reading, not without hesitation. Seems like I'll have to keep my eye on him. Third call, players remain in silence for the duration of the conference. We'd like to remind you that photography is restricted to all the eyes press. The lights of the room begin to dim until they turn off completely, and the auditorium's only remaining illumination are the spotlights above the stage. A man in a suit appears from the left end of the stage, followed by Professor Schultz. He stops at the podium, and soon any hopes of conversation are drowned by the audience's applauds. Please welcome Professor Han Schultz, head of the Schultz Holt Foundation. There's another round of applause this time, much louder, after a couple of seconds pass. Schultz holds his hand up for the whole room, and the whole room goes quiet. Slowly, the floor next to him 
begins to open and everyone watches in awe as the case in which the diamond is kept raises from it. I had seen pictures of it before, of course, but it doesn't compare to seeing it in person. As you all know, the Angolan is among the rarest gemstones in the world. Flawless both in its surface and its interior, it allows both heat and electricity to be conducted with minimal dispersion up to... I pressed the button on the side of my watch. I couldn't risk bringing too much equipment on my person, but I managed to fit both a communicator and a small laser into my watch. At my signal, the doors burst open and the henchmen appear, while the ones that had been posing as ushers hurry to lock the doors behind them. My uncle only ended up lending me about half a dozen of them, but since the more people inside have since the people inside have no way to tell, they are more than enough. There are whispers and confusion at first, but the room goes completely quiet when Schultz slams his hand against the podium. What is the meaning of this? Security! Get the people out of here! I stand up, and I'm escorted to the stage by that one henchman whose name I should probably know by now. While we walk, he goes ahead and hands me the control of the bombs. It's mostly for show since we only wired enough bombs to mess up some of the less important rooms slightly, while the rest of the decoys set to release smoke. Of course, they don't know that. There has been a slight change of plans, Professor. As I take the podium, I put down the control in front of me and I signal the henchman to ret restrain Schultz. They both get off the stage and he leads the professor towards the side of the auditorium. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated. If you cooperate and do exactly as you are told, no one will get hurt. When you look back to this moment in a few years, you'll realize that it was the most important day of your life. Scientific achievements, political careers, everything you've done will pale in comparison to this instant. And that is because today you'll become part of history. You'll have the honor, the honor of witnessing the birth of one of the greatest supervillains known to man, Dr. Cyclops. As of right now, you also have the honor of being my hostages. Hopefully the government values your lives. I'm briefly interrupted by the sound of talking coming from amongst the seats. I decide to ignore it and continue. Enough to pay the... When it happens again, I stop speaking and begin to look over the crowd, searching for the source of the interruption. Most of the guests have either, either have either a look of fear or discomfort on their faces, and some of them even shake their heads when they notice me looking at them. What do I have henchmen for if they can't keep people from talking at the same time as me? Finally, I notice that the henchman is out of place, standing at the end of the row rather than at his place next to Schultz. It se he seems to be arguing with someone. I step down from the stage to get a better look, and I recognize the other person as the man from the lobby. What are you doing? Sit down. I'm going over to the bathroom unless you want to get sick all over the floor. He stands up and gives a few steps forward. Actually, it's more of an awkward stumbling. He looks really drunk. Hi, I say you aren't going anywhere. The henchman grabs his arm to stop him. Suddenly, the man turns around and punches him square in the nose, knocking him out cold in the process. Stepping around the henchman's unconscious body, he puts a hand inside his jacket and takes out a gun. At first, I'm amused by the idea of getting shot by an overeager drunk but he manages to point it right at me just fine. Agent Hunter, Global, you're all under arrest. Shit. People begin to turn to look at him, whispering to each other until the crowd's attention is divided between the two of us. Meanwhile, none of the henchmen move, unsure of what to do. The only security on site was supposed to be the museum's guards and some of the local police stations outside. There was nothing to make us think that an agent of Global would be here, let alone armed. The henchmen could deal with him through sheer numbers alone, but I need them to keep control of the crowd. If everyone begins to panic, it's not going to be good for any of us. I decide to try and bluff, so I shrug and laugh it off. Nice try, but you wouldn't risk a shootout in a room full of civilians. 
or for me to blow this place sky high. I pick up the control and put my index finger on the big red button in the middle of it. See this? My men have put bombs all around the museum. One false move and I'll push it. Will you still inside? No, I don't think so. As for your henchmen, my aim is pretty good and something tells me none of them want to be the ones to get their boss shot. Guess we'll have to see who's faster. Get him! The henchmen are getting ready to fire when I'm blinded by a flash of white light. Out of instinct, I drop the control and raise my arms to cover my good eye, but the moment makes me lose my balance and I end up falling back. Grenade! Everybody out! Hold your fire! My vision is blurry so much that I barely see the second flash of light when it goes off. I hear the people begin to scream, but the noise sounds distant, as if I was in another room altogether. It's not much of a relief, but at least that means that they were flashing grenades rather than fragmentation ones. It takes a couple of seconds for my eyesight to come back completely, and a couple more for me to regain enough strength to be able to stand up. I look around. Half of the henchmen are on the floor covering their ears in pain, and the other half still looks too confused to do anything. Upon realizing that no one is blocking their way anymore, the people in the seats begin to run towards the exits in panic, pushing each other and screaming. By the time the henchmen try to regain control of the situation, the whole room has descended into chaos. In front of me, Agent Hunter points his gun in my direction and begins to approach. Or at least he's trying to. His hand is shaking, shaking so much that it's obvious that he's just as disoriented as I am. I frown. If it wasn't him, then who? He looks at me, then at the floor, and stops. It looks down. I look down and well, as well and realize it's the control. He hurls himself forward and grabs it. I take the opportunity to kick the gun out from his other hand, but he holds onto my leg and pulls me down with him. We both end up on the floor trying to wrestle the control out of each other's hands. While Hunter may be stronger, right now I'm the one in better condition, so I manage to hold my own against him. We keep rolling around on the floor until I manage to flip him over and pin him down. He's going to kiss him. <laughs> Has anyone ever told you that this is your best angle? Shut up and give it back. As we continue to struggle for the for control, I notice someone get on the stage out of it, out of the corner of my eye. I turn my head to see the blonde man from the lobby walk up to the diamond's case and lift it up. It's a brief distraction, but it's enough for me enough to give Hunter the upper hand he needs to push me off of him. When I fall back, the control is sent flying into the air, and Hunter and me stare at it as it lands right on the detonator. Well, well, shit. Of course nothing happens. It's a decoy, isn't it? Hunter shakes his head in disbelief, wiping a bead of sweat from his brow with the back of his hand. But instead of looking angry, he seems rather amused by the whole situation. Having decided that this that his immediate business with me is done, he runs past me onto the stage to catch up with the other man. They begin fighting over the diamond right away, trying to keep the other from getting a proper hold of it. They're pretty evenly matched at first, but the longer the fight lasts, the more Hunter struggles to keep up. Whoever the Russian is, it's clear that he's not just some random guest or some opportunistic thief. It will be easy on a m It'll be an easy mission, they said. No one cares about the old rock anymore, they said. Why does the KGB even want with it? Don't you commies dislike everything that may be worth more than a ruble? Be quiet. That the diamond is the property of Soviet government. I've come to take it back. Global and the KGB? I knew there was something odd about those two. Good thing I'm not here for the diamond. Let them fight over it while we get away with Schultz. I walk over to where the henchman is and nudge him awake with my foot. He stands up holding the side of his head with a pained expression. His nose is bleeding from Hunter's punch and he has split. He has a split lip. He's pretty lucky that he didn't get trampled by people on their way out. Put yourself together. We need to get Schultz and get out of here before the agent notices. Can you help me get him to the vehicle? Yes. Go tell the others to get out and get everything ready. I'll hold Schultz back in the meantime. He nods and goes running to where the other henchmen are. They still look confused from the grenade, but they are in well enough shape to pick up their guns and head to the exit. Speaking of Schultz, where is he? The professor didn't leave much leave with the rest of the people. Instead, he's been watching both men fight over the diamond. He obviously cares more about it than for his own safety. He's even too distracted to notice us as I approach from behind. 
Professor, if you would be so kind as to come with me. Schultz turns around, alarmed. I'm about to grab him when there's a loud noise right outside the auditorium. I feel the floor move, and I lose my step. The room quickly begins to fill with smoke and dust, and I cover my mouth and nose with my sleeve. What the hell? That sounded like a bomb, but how? Never mind, I'll figure that out later. Right now, Schultz is more important. The smoke gets thicker by the second, and it soon becomes impossible to distinguish anything more than a couple meters away. I have just enough visibility to get to see two blurry figures through the smoke, each running towards the exit through different rows. One of them must be Schultz. The only people left here besides me and the henchmen were the professor and both agents, who I'm pretty sure are still on stage. Damn, it's too dark. I can't see their faces. Boss, where are you? Over here. Between the two of us, it should be enough to incapacitate Schultz and carry him outside. Once there, the others will take care of the rest. I start to run towards... Uh, the man in the black suit. I tackle the man in the black suit and I keep him on the ground long enough for the henchman to take out the bag and rope that he's carrying. He puts the bag over the professor's head and ties his hand and feet. He struggles a lot more than I expected and we end up having to knock him out before being able to drag him out of the building. With some effort, we get the professor out of the building and all the way to where we'd left the vehicle. After putting him inside the trunk, we head back to the base. While the henchman drives, I take off my suit and just keep my uniform on. It's just as dirty as the suit, but at least it's more comfortable now. Fortunately, the professor remains unconscious for the whole duration of the trip, so we won't have any more setbacks in that regard. Sphinx Lair, currently serving as Dr. Cyclops' base of operation, somewhere in Germany. When we get to the base, the other henchmen hurry to help us carry Schultz to the laboratory. <laughs> they put him down on the chair that we prepared for him loosening up the rope slightly so that he'll be as comfortable as the situation allows. I originally considered putting him in a cell, but I want to make it clear that he doesn't have a choice about helping my uncle while he's here. That didn't go exactly as planned, but you know what they say. What really matters are the results. And despite everything, we managed to get Schultz here. Congratulations, everyone. You can leave now. The henchmen look really relieved to hear me say it. I think they were worried that I was going to blame them for what happened back at the museum. Which, to be fair, I was ready to do before we got our hands on the professor. They nod quietly as they all leave the laboratory, except for the henchman that helped me bring him here, who stays behind in case I need anything. I still need to figure out what the agents were doing back there and why we didn't hear about it. But that can wait until later. Right now, this is about me. Schultz raises his head as he regains consciousness. He seems rather sluggish at first, probably from a combination of the smoke and being stuffed into the trunk for a couple of hours, but then he straightens up. I lean over the professor, arms crossed behind my back, making sure that he'll be able, I'll be the first thing that he sees. I may not be physically imposing, but like this, even I manage to look intimidating. With a nod, I gesture to the henchman to remove the hood from his head. I'm sure you were wondering why I brought you here, Professor Schultz? Oh no! Ah, yeah. Damn it. But when the hood comes off, I freeze. The man in the chair isn't Schultz, the American agent. He seems confused as he turns his head to look at the henchman. But as soon as he sees me, he grins. All right, you got me there. I wasn't expecting this. I take a couple steps back, doing my best to remain calm until I'm certain that I'm out of Agent Hunter's sight. The henchman follows me on my way out, though he has a much harder time hiding his nervousness. Once we're at the entrance, I grab the henchman by the shoulders and begin to push him in the general direction of my uncle's office. Go call Sphinx. Tell him it's urgent. Go call the guards, too. Nobody goes in or out of this room until... until he's out of here? Yes, yes sir. Now get something to restrain him with. If he can move one finger, he's moving too much. I stay outside of the laboratory while I wait occasionally looking back inside to check on Hunter. The fact that he's so calm doesn't make me feel any better. As I wait for my uncle, I end up pacing in circles in front. I end up pacing in circles before realizing it. <clears throat> Though I manage to keep a serious face rather than one of outright panic, my agitation eventually wins and I begin to bite my fingernails. How could I have messed up so badly? My uncle is going to kill me or worse yet, he's going to send me overseas to make and make and 
to send me overseas and make and roll in college. As soon as I hear someone approach, I make myself stop. It's the henchman, followed by a couple of guards carrying a metal table with them. It's nothing fancy, but it'll do. They acknowledge me with a silent nod as they walk by on their way inside, which I return with much confidence as I can. The guards put me, put the table down in the middle of the room next to where Agent Hunter is sitting, secure to the floor. They untie Hunter's legs with then pretty much throw him on top of the table. He lets out a groan when he hits the metal, and the guards strap him down. With Hunter properly secured, they each take their position at opposite sides of the table. We're going to see what happens <laughs> um, from there, ladies and gentlemen, because I've been talking for 40 minutes now, <laughs> and I'm a little tired. So we're going to stop there and see what we can do um, with our uncle, with everything else, see what happens with the now uh, Texas American agent that I have strapped to a table that I'm flirting with. Hopefully I can flirt him into living with me. We'll see. Until then, ladies and gentlemen. Or if you want to see more of Blind Men as played by a dude who can barely see, be sure to get at me. I'm at Seth Trav, and be sure to subscribe, rate, like, all the beautiful things. Until next time, always practice. Mm-hmm.